Um, right now. Yeah, if we want to go ahead and <laughs> welcome <excited>. everyone. <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, we're so excited that you can be with us today. Uh, I'm the deacon. At, this is Lynette Bartell. I'm the deacon at Messiah Lutheran. Uh, we have been working with care partners for actually many years, and doing these lunch and learns is uh, something new. We've started in the last two or three years, and it's been such a blessing to us, and I hope to the community around us as uh, care partners. Uh, shares their uh, resources and their uh, presenters with us, and uh, we are honored to be part of it. So thank mm -hmm. you to all of you. And thank you so much, Lynette. Um, we're so happy and so excited to be partnering with you guys. You guys always have um, just great resources, and we love working on these workshops with you. So um, I guess with that, we can go ahead and get started with the presentation. Um, Caitlin, are you starting or is Melissa? Melissa is going to be starting. Okay, yeah. So we're going to be starting today with uh, Melissa. She is the owner of Caregiver Wellness Retreats, and I'm going to let her talk a little bit more about herself. That was the easiest introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't want to talk about myself, but I will. Um, so I began Caregiver Wellness Retreat uh, in 2015. My father was the caregiver for my stepmom who had early onset Alzheimer's and it was her primary care pretty much for about a decade. And so watching her decline, but also paralleling his decline um, was so impactful for me and always living somewhere else. So a long distance caregiver, I was searching for what I could do to be of service, not only to my dad, but those that are like my dad. And so the retreat began. And in essence, we're not about dementia education. I'm really interested in what we can do to be sort of almost like that first responder to the caregiver. So how can we essentially prevent <laughs> all of the effects that are cumulative that happen as a, as a caregiver cares? And, and I have a really strong sense of understanding of even, even when that loved one or the individual that you're caring for is no longer with you, wow, the impact stays with you for a long time. And so what can we do to not only edify you as a caregiver, but offer you resources and tools, and, and most of which you probably already have within you. It's just a matter of practicing. And I think really in essence, all of life is, is practicing. So let me know if anyone else has arrived. No, okay. <laughs> We're all in the same boat then. Um, so today I'll give you a little bit of a menu of, of what, we'll, what we'll do together. Uh, I, I have a, a, a screen I'm gonna show you in just a minute and we'll do some experiential and some discussion. So it'll kind of go back and forth. My hope is that you'll be able to take some of these tools and put them in your back pocket. Um, and then we'll send you also some links later for some things that, that you can do that will in essence um, be of help to you wherever you are in your journey right now. And I would love if you have access to type it into the chat um, to let me know a little bit about your caregiving experience. Um, so you might just pop in there if you're uh, what type of caregiver you are. So maybe you're long-term, um, long distance, <laughs> uh, any, any other information about your caregiving, or if you're not a caregiver. I think uh, the philosophy that I have is wherever you fall on that spectrum, at some point in your life, you will be. So, um, you know, the, the, the odds and the statistics are there whether it's caring for a small one or, um, or an aging adult, um, we all have a, in some point in our lives, a role of caregiving, or it could even be for a neighbor. So thank you, Lynette, for typing in the chat. I appreciate that, yeah. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, vision. I'll minimize that. I just want to make sure I can see my screen. I should ask you if you can see mine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've made that mistake before. A whole presentation and they're like, there's nothing there, Melissa. I can. 
<laughs> so, all right. So let's just take a moment. Um, in my introduction, I didn't mention, uh, I've been in the wellness industry for about 30 years. Um, and one of the tools that I find quite useful is, is being able to pause and use, in essence, uh, it's a big popular word these days, but mindfulness. So as you are gazing at this picture, where does your eye go? What do you notice? What are the colors like? Can you begin to imagine yourself just simply walking forward toward a path in the forest? What is the temperature like? What does the sun feel like on your skin? What do you notice under your feet? Do you feel the crunch of the leaves as you walk? And then imagine yourself just simply pausing. And instead of taking a narrow view of just looking at one tree, what is it like to feel the sides of your eyes widen and take in the full landscape view, the whole path? As you're doing that, what do you notice about your breathing? What do you notice about your shoulders? Do they drop? Maybe your breathing elevates. There's a sense of delight or excitement, or maybe you notice that it slows down. Is there a sense of calmness? And then as you're looking and taking this wide view, allow yourself to look up. You could even imagine spreading a blanket, lying down in the, in the grass or the leaves and softening and just letting your eyes follow the light. Notice what you notice. Maybe you're looking distally as far away as you can see, or maybe your eyes catch the bark of the tree, the shape of the leaves. Notice any sensations in the body. Is there a warmth? and ease. What is the sound like? Can you hear the leaves rustling? Is there a wind or no wind? Maybe a bird. Notice if there's any difference between how you felt in the first experience, just looking straight ahead versus now looking up at the tree crowns. What's shifted and what's changed? Wherever you are in your breathing patterns, just allow yourself to softly exhale. No forcing, just notice the exhale. So 
So when we take a different perspective, and that's what I hope that we do today, we see things that we never experienced before. How often do you actually look up? To look up, you have to stop moving. You can't keep walking forward. There has, or unless you want to run into something, <laughs> there has to be a pause. And that pause allows you to observe, to breathe, to notice. There's a research study that of, of those studying the forest floor and different species of trees. And what they discovered is that the team that was doing this particular research study would have missed 54% of a certain species and 20% of another if they hadn't surveyed the crown of the tree. 54%. They would have overlooked another 38% of another type. So in order for us to fully evaluate a situation, a circumstance, we have to take the whole tree into consideration. So I'll ask you, whatever you're facing today, how many of you have just looked at what what was causing the concern, the suffering, the anger or anxiety? And how, how often do you just take a step back and try to look at it from a different angle? Perhaps maybe the other person's perspective. There's something about this shared humanity that we all have as caregivers on this call I think just knowing that we're not alone changes our perspective and shifts us just slightly. I'm gonna share my screen again. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, the pillars of, re of resilience today. And there's so many aspects to this, and I know um, Leslie and Caitlin will both share some of their own resilience stories. Resilience encompasses self-awareness. So when you were stepping into that forest, were you able to notice sensations in the body versus perhaps emotions? Mindfulness is simply an, a really easy definition, which I love uh, if you're familiar with Viktor Frankl. He was a Holocaust survivor, a psychologist, a neurologist. And he said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in the response lies our growth and freedom. So mindfulness is that, that point in which we become aware of something and then there's a space, we stop, we look up. And that pause allows us the ability to either act or react. So in essence, it's a tool for that self self-regulation and cultivating a greater sense of the ability to pause. Self-care, uh, there is a lot I could say about self-care, <laughs> but it is not, it is not, um, I don't preach bubble baths and um, uh, what, how it's commercialized. I believe self-care could be as simple as, have you had water today? Have you um, paused today? Have you gotten up and walked around today? It can be really, really simple. Positive relationships uh, and purpose. So I'm gonna pause there for a moment. When we think about integrating positive relationships, when we examine actually what our nervous system does. 
So your body actually begins to recognize our ability to co-regulate before your ability to self-regulate. So what that means is, and uh, I'll give you an example. I was in the um, grocery store the other day. I don't go to the grocery store. I haven't been like in a year and a half. <laughs> so, so it was like a trepidatious experience, you know, experiment and, and what is, you know, kind of peeking out the door, what is the real world like at the moment? Um, I, I've, I have very fortunate that I have a partner who is, who is taken on the task of going to the grocery store. So I recognize my privilege here. That said, I explored the grocery and I had um, a couple of bouquets of flowers and I was going to take some flowers to a friend and, um, you know, some other things in my basket and everyone's looking down and we're, we're all taped off and, and marked off. Santa Fe follows the rules evidently. And so we're, you know, kind of in our own little space. You can't see anyone's expressions, right? Except for their eyes. And this gentleman pipes up behind me and says, wow, those are beautiful. Whoever's going to get those, they're lucky. And I felt, and notice when I said that, notice what you notice in your own body. I felt my shoulders drop. I smiled underneath my mask. You could see all the crinkles around my eyes. It was so delightful, just something so simple. And then in that moment, I realized that we were you know, co-regulating. We were having an exchange with one another and he had the power based on his words to impact me that day. And I had the power to impact him. I was in, um, also, I was very adventurous this last week. <laughs> so <laughs> we went to a museum and saw an exhibit uh, and then we went to lunch afterwards. It was a big day. So we were sitting there at a table and, and my son who's 15 was with me and this family walks by with a baby and the baby was no mask, right? Just, just a little, little, little wee one. And I lit up. I mean, I can't tell you the time I, last time I saw a real baby <laughs> in person. <laughs> I've been so sheltered in place and not around that environment. And so I just lit up and I started making these really silly faces and trying to get the baby to smile. And, and of course, my 15 year old is mortified. He's like, mom, what are you doing? And I, and I nudged him and I said, look at the baby. And the baby was cooing and smiling right back at me. It was, I have goosebumps just thinking about the experience. My ability to respond to this baby and our interaction, there's no inhibition with this baby. It doesn't know that I'm, you know, there's no stranger danger yet. It hasn't been conditioned. <laughs> it just, it's just responding to a person smiling at them. How beautiful is that? And I was just so moved. And of course, Andrew was just, you know, rolling his eyes a little bit. But I said, look at that. Look what we can do. Look how we can shift and change just based on how we respond to others. So co-regulation is something actually within our nervous system that is a, an autonomic response. So we have the ability to basically uh, interact with one another in such a way that can influence each other's nervous systems. We can elicit fear, we can elicit hope, we can elicit excitement, we can elicit comfort. We can just be with someone and our presence alone can, can have a, what we would call a parasympathetic response in our nervous system, calming, soothing. And it can also have the opposite. And then we can practice that. We can also practice that self-regulation, but at, that's actually a secondary response. So for us to become aware of what's happening in our body, and so you can think back to the forest and the trees. Did anyone sense just a, like a sense of peace or calm? Did anyone notice something physiologically happening in their body? Did something soften? Did your eyes widen when I mentioned widening the eyes? 
So we have the ability to tune into these physiological responses before we label them, you know, however we want to label them. And so that would be the difference between sensations and emotion. So where we get into kind of some thick, thick water is when we start to decide that emotions are permanent. <laughs> and so what's beautiful about the pause is that it allows us to say, what is true right now? What is, what is actually true in this experience right now? Am I really, if we're interpreting anxiety, am I really in danger? In this, just in this moment right now, or I'm feeling sadness, you know, I might feel some tears or a lump in my throat and just noticing that. And then what is that sadness like? Can I be with that sadness rather than putting on the brave soldier hat? If I can be with the sadness for a moment, then that allows it to shift and change, allows it to change me. So there's so many options and opportunities to take this pause and realize or recognize the physiological sensations. Are they true? Or is our, is our body just telling us what it thinks it is? So we are wired and designed, our nervous system is designed to respond to extreme danger. But most of us, I'm sitting here in my very comfortable home, I'm not in danger. And there's a fine line between anxiety and excitement and worry and fear. So just being able to hit the pause button and really ask, is this true? Is this true? Love to share with you for a moment. I'm gonna share my screen again. <laughs> All right. And I've put it up on the screen, but I'll read it to you. Uh, I would need glasses. So I'm gonna read <laughs> from my book. If you're not familiar with John O'Donohue, to me, one of the most remar remarkable writers who's no longer with us. Um, and he's written some beautiful books. This is from his book called Bless the Space Between Us, a book of blessings. Awaken to the mystery of being here. Enter the quiet immensity of your own presence. Have joy and peace in the temple of your senses. Receive encouragement when new frontiers beckon. Respond to the call of your gift and the courage to follow its path. Let the flame of anger free you of all falsity. May warmth of heart keep your presence aflame. May anxiety never linger about you. May your outer dignity mirror the inner dignity of your soul. I'm going to say that one again. May your outer dignity mirror the inner dignity of your soul. Take time to celebrate the quiet miracles that seek no attention. Be consoled in the symmetry of your soul. And may you experience each day as a sacred gift woven around the heart of wonder. May you awaken to the mystery of being here. When we think about what it means to be here, we don't think about that as a mystery. Anyone else? <laughs> it feels very mundane to me at the moment. <laughs> it's like, what day is it again? And I think, oh, more, more of this, more of this. But what if we step back looked at the tree crowns, whatever it is that, that can remind you to have that sense of wonder and awe. That 
idea of being able to notice and come immediately present. So we'll do we'll do one simple technique that I use probably all the time, several times a day. <laughs> so however you're sitting right now, if your legs are crossed, uncross your legs and just put both feet on the floor. And notice your feet. Maybe if you feel disconnected from your feet, maybe you look at them or wiggle your toes or scrunch your toes or rub the feet, the soles of the feet on the ground so you can feel a little friction there. And then just pause and notice. When we take our attention distally down to the feet, we're immediately taking our attention away from anything we're ruminating on. So if I can bring my attention to the feet, sensations, awareness, can even go a step further. Imagine inhabiting your feet, opening a little door, walking inside the feet themselves, feel the bones, maybe you feel a pulse, a tingle, some fluid. It's okay if you don't, if you don't, wiggle, move, feel that. So just notice. I found when I was a kid that I, I would do this technique without even knowing kind of what it is or the science behind it. When I would get into a challenging situation or someone was giving me a talking to, <laughs> I find that I could use that to not react to really, it actually helped me start to pay attention to what the other person was saying, but not start formulating my response to it. So just by doing that, sometimes I'll find if I, if I put my hands together, that does a similar thing, keeps me present or feeling what I'm touching, maybe even the texture of my clothing or the texture of my skin. I'm still listening but I'm not formulating a response. I'm not critiquing or shaming myself. I'm not taking in their judgment necessarily, but I'm able to listen. That's really quite remarkable. Another technique to get you quite present is just to simply breathe and count. Sometimes breathing for some people can feel a little bit anxious. And so if that's you and you know that that's you, that's okay. You can use the technique of feeling or what we would call a somatic, which is feeling an aliveness from the inside with movement. So soma means living aware. And so, and it's living aware within movement. So if breathing isn't necessarily working for you, what I do is I'll add a little movement with that. You notice I talk with my hands a lot, <laughs> but it might mean something like this. So if I'm gonna focus on breath and that feels a little anxious to me, I'll use my shoulders with it. So you guys can do this with me. Breathe in and lift your shoulders and just breathe out and slowly lower your shoulders, but see how slow you can do it. So you're focused more on the movement than necessarily the breath itself. And then do that again, breathing in. Instead of uh, trying to focus the breath way up here, see if you can focus the breath down low. And then notice like a wave, follow the shoulders down all the way into the feet. You can do that also with arms um, with my stepmom when she was with us. Um, we would, I would do some breathing movement with her. I would actually physically take and hold her arm and I would just breathe in and then I would lower her arm and we'd breathe out. It didn't really even matter if she was able to follow or not, but it was just the slowness of it and my breath. And what I noticed is even though she couldn't follow my verbal command, her breathing started to synchronize with mine. 
And so just that gentleness of breathing, following, lifting her arm and lowering her arm. And you can do the same, just you. We can take our arm either out to the side, I can't move it forward with my desk, but you can just simply breathe in and lift and raise the arm. And then just softly exhale. And so the pace of the breath mirrors the movement. So notice how slow I'm moving. Slow, slow, slow. When we are feeling um, tired, we want to focus more on the inhalation. That's going to be enlivening. That's the sympathetic part of your breath. When you are feeling maybe a little more anxious or in need of calming down, then focus on the expiration of the breath. That's the parasympathetic part. So both of those, again, all day long, isn't it beautiful we don't have to tell ourselves to breathe? Thank God, <laughs> when none of us would be here, <laughs> we would be like, I forgot. <laughs> so it's self-regulating, thankfully. But the breath is the one thing that we have the power to control something that's autonomic. That's really remarkable, actually, if you think about it, just how incredible your body is. So let's go back to what, what he says after talking about this, awaken to the mystery of being here and enter the quiet immensity of your own presence. So just based on what we just learned, you have the power to imagine being inside your feet. You have the control and the ability to regulate your breath, which you don't have control over how your heart beats except for your breath. You don't have control of how your liver functions, <laughs> but you do have control of what you put in your body. So there are these amazing and miraculous things about you that if you just pause to notice, they're all accessible to you. I'll, I'll cover one more. I think I could probably talk to you guys all day, but I'll spare you that. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be relieved. Oh, it says, have joy and peace in the temple of your senses. Have joy and peace in the temple of your senses. I don't remember who told me this, and I wish I did so that I could credit them. You are peace and joy. You are not anxiety. You are not stress. You are not pain. You are not, and you could probably fill in the blank with whatever your thing is. <laughs> maybe you, you've got a label that you've given yourself, or maybe you've got a label somebody else has given you. But homeostasis, I mean, this is science. The essence of who you are is a balance. You are made up of that enlivening and calming. You have the ability to self-regulate and co-regulate. So you have all of these gifts within you. So we are not meant to function at anxiety. We're not meant to function fully in suffering, <laughs> but we are meant to find homeostasis. And so when these things though do happen, how do we curb it? And how do we turn that direction? I believe it's meant with these little moments of hitting the reset button on our nervous system. It's these little pauses. What happens when we don't hit these little pauses, right? Is things start to accumulate <laughs> and layer and build. But by just hitting these little resets, it's like, oh, okay. Then this moment is okay. This is what's true right now. And then we might build again. <laughs> and then, okay, here's what's true in this moment. So these little resets, like 
finding your breath, finding your feet, looking at nature. Even the studies show, even just looking out your window at something green. The studies that they did in the early 90s and late 80s um, about those that are in hospitals and that the ones who have a window recover 25% faster than those who don't. Just being able to look at this green space is powerful. So we'll do one more, um, one more practice together. And I call it sort of that, it's that homeostasis thing I just mentioned. It's the idea of surfing or riding something that you're being present with. One of the things that um, I am well aware of that, that is pretty universal, and it's this idea that we're all experiencing some kind of grief or loss. You cannot have gone through a pandemic <laughs> for a year and change and not had some kind of loss. Whether it's, for me, it was loss of freedom, of feeling like I could go to the grocery store. It was loss of in income, tremendous amount. It was loss of uh, travel, of family. So we, you get the idea. <laughs> you could all list your losses. And, and so this collective loss or grief that we're all experiencing together. And it's like, it's almost the elephant in the room sometimes. But what if instead you considered um, setting a little appointment with this thing that you are ruminating on, checking in with your grief, allowing it to not just stuff it away or ignore that it's there because it's there for all of us. What if there was an appointment with it? So I'll give you an example in my own life. Um, my, I was working with a, an issue with my son and there has been a lot of grief and loss in that, in that situation. And it hasn't been something that I could talk with him about. Um, he's, you know, not, not interested in discussing it. So I need to process it though. What I did uh, for about two months time and your timing will be different from my timing, which will be different from someone else's timing. I don't put a timeline on grief, but I would sit and I would say, okay, grief, there's your time. <laughs> I took out a journal and I would just allow myself to write and it didn't need to make any sense to anyone but me because nobody was gonna read it. Sometimes I wrote to my son from my highest self, not from my angry self, <laughs> but I would write uh, from my highest self, from that, that self that is, that is joy and peace. And I would, you know, maybe write a little response from his highest self. Sometimes I would, let's see if I have it here. Oh, I had it sitting here to show you but that's okay. I'm not sure where it is at the moment, but sometimes I would watercolor. So there's a little orchid that, that he gave me that lasted miraculously almost through the entire pandemic. And I do not have a green thumb in spite of all the plants behind me. And so I painted these little orchids and I put it on my wall. So I just made an appointment. And then when that time was up, I put it aside. And if grief popped back up later in the day, I'd say, I'll see you later. We have an appointment in the morning. I'll see you, I'll see you then. It allowed me an opportunity to feel in a situation I felt I had no control of. A little bit of control. I could function through my day. I could interact with people I needed to interact with and I could have you know, um, I could laugh at something funny. I could be present with my other son. But when our, my appointment came up with grief, I could cry. I could be with it. I could let it take its time. And then I could also set it aside. 
And it took about two months to kind of move through this. And then he was also ready to talk to me. So it moved a little quicker than I thought. But I do this with several different things, something that I'm really, that's really gnawing at me or something I feel I've lost. I just set that little appointment and I give it the time it needs and then I let it rest. If anyone has any, if you're a ruminator, you know who you are. <laughs> or sometimes, you know, little things that'll come up and take you by surprise. Like, wow, that movie really reminded me of my stepmom. Or, oh, that story reminded me of this situation. I could be with it, but then I could also tell it and I'm going to see you tomorrow. We're going to talk about that later. And it was almost like a hug or a comfort or a way to, to really allow myself to process rather than stuff it down. I'll share one more anecdotal with you. So uh, several years ago, about five years ago now, I had something called frozen shoulder. Has anyone ever had that or heard of it? I know it just sounds awful, doesn't it? Leslie, you've had it. No, no, you're familiar with it. <laughs> no, my mother had it. I didn't have it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I wouldn't wish, wish it on my worst enemy. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> it's some of the most excruciating pain that I've ever experienced. And you can't lift your arm. I couldn't pull up my pants. Couldn't fasten a bra. I mean, it was just crazy. And I just thought I was crazy. And then it became bilateral. So I had it in both arms. And part of it, and I had MRIs and all kinds of things, there was no real injury there for me. There was no tear, there was no surgery needed. So it was very nervous system related. And so, wow, that really hit home. I teach this stuff for a living. So, so wow, that was really eye-opening for me. And I thought for a moment, what am I, what am I ignoring? What am I stuffing away? So much so that my body had to immobilize itself for me to pay attention. That was such a wake-up call. And also really interesting. You know, you, you navigate, you learn, you adjust, you shift. I can lift my arms now. It's all, <laughs> uh, but the healing process has been long. So I'll ask you, what is whispering at you right now? Maybe sharing with you inside. It could be, could be a physical or physiological thing. Could be something outside. What's whispering that later might not be a whisper? that maybe setting just a simple appointment with to check in with would be really helpful. So I'm gonna close with this. I'm gonna share my screen one more time. Let's see. Some questions to ask yourself. And if you want to journal this or jot this down as we, as we do it, um, I'd love that. What am I grateful for today? I'm not talking about being Pollyanna here. It's not helpful. <laughs> uh, what do you, what, in this moment, in this moment, I can take a sip of my coffee. In this moment, I can wiggle my toes. In this moment, what am I grateful for? Who am I checking in on or connecting with today? Who am I checking in on or connecting with today? So this goes to that positive relationships and purpose. What expectations of normal am I letting go of today? I'm sure you've read or thought about 
you know, what is the new normal? Well, then the new normal changes the next month, <laughs> the next week or the next day. So there really isn't necessarily normal anymore. What can I release or allow? Am I getting outside today? This picture on the left side of your screen here reminds me so much of a Georgia O'Keeffe painting um, that she did in upstate New York. And I think, I think how soothing, I mean, just taking a moment to even glance at the water and the reflection, notice what you feel, what you observe. Nature is its own wonder and an instant reset for your nervous system. Am I moving my body today? So if you haven't moved and you've been listening to me this whole time without moving, so I might suggest a big pendicular stretch. In other words, you could reach your arms up and stretch your legs out, wiggle the hips a little bit or shift them side to side and just notice how that feels now. Just something that simple. And what beauty am I creating, cultivating or inviting today? What beauty am I creating, cultivating or inviting today? The last few lines of his, his uh, blessing for presence was, Take time to celebrate the quiet miracles that seek no attention. Be consoled in the symmetry of your heart and your soul. And may you experience each day as a sacred gift woven around the heart of wonder. So let's take just an exhale. So notice the shoulders drop, maybe separate the teeth. Take a moment to check in with yourself now compared to when we began our talk together. What's shifted for you, if anything? And I'd love, I feel like I've been giving a monologue here. So if anyone wants to share, <laughs> <laughs> a sentence or two know that if you do um come off that you would probably be in the recording so i'll i'll say that caitlin were you gonna share <laughs> no no i just i'm i'm processing like i, I just i feel like there's there's just a lot to process i'm really glad you went first though because um, I walked into this afternoon super stressed and anxious, and I'm like, okay, we're breathing now, we're, we're relaxing now, everything's okay now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think for me, what spoke, uh, what I'm ruminating on right now, because I am a ruminator, um, is the what is true. Mm. And, and so much of caregiving is reactionary. Um, you have to, and you have, feel like you have to be on top of everything all the time. You know, the doctors and the health and the medicine and the schedule and, and the entertainment and, and all of that. Mm. Um, and oftentimes caregivers lose the ability or, or forget that they have the ability to choose how they do those things. And, and the way that they approach those things, because we have to do them. We can't get out of them. We can't just stop going to the doctor, but how we approach that or how we give ourselves grace and forgiveness when we approach it badly um, matters. So that's just me processing. And I highly recommend if when Melissa does her conference or her, her uh, retreat, mm -hmm. volunteer, 
please go. It's a wonderful, wonderful experience. I was a participant one year and I've gone to volunteer for two years and I will keep volunteering. We love having you, Leslie. Oh my God, it's so much fun. (laughs) It's pretty sweet. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. Uh, I love, I, I really didn't get the chance. I didn't have the chat open, but I have it now and get a chance to see your, your comments. Um, yeah. So thank you. Finding your feet. Mm. And we are going to have a, a Q and a after Leslie and I talk. Okay. Great. Um, that's so that that's my, my cue. <laughs> no, that, that may have sounded a little bit like a hook. Hanging off the stage. I love no, it. Um, oh, yeah, all good. No, because there's, there's, it was rich, and you want to think about it and process it. So you can't think of your question now or your comment now. There's still time. I think that's what I was trying to say, but said poorly. Or no, it's, I'm just teasing you. It was perfect. So I just put in the chat um, a couple of things kind of coming up for us, and that's in there, and then it'll all be in your after email. So. Um, I wouldn't worry about it now. So thank you all. I'm just going to mute myself. (laughs) So uh, that's me now. Um, I, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Caitlin Jordan. I am a coordinator for Care Partners. I think I need to put my key down. I can do both. Um, but my, my background is actually is in the church. I was ordained in 2007. I have a master's in divinity and I served in churches for 11 years before I started doing this. So, um, when we were talking about what to do at this workshop, um, and we were talking about balance and well-being and caregiving, I really wanted to take a, a multifaceted approach. Um, and so, and I, and, and part of that, you know, Melissa does the, the emotional and the physical well-being and the grounding, but there's also other ways that we need to find that balance, one of which is spiritual. Um, and then when I'm done, let's just going to talk about the practical, um, because all of this is, is beautiful and wonderfully said, but we have to be able to do it in our day-to-day lives and, and make it a part of our day-to-day lives. So I'm going to also share my screen. All right. Don't you all love technology? Here we go. Okay, so finding spiritual balance in caregiving. Um, And I wanted to start off by defining how we're talking about spirituality today. Um, Faith, spirituality, religion, they are all intertwined. They, they all work together in ways that are very personal and um, individual. But for the purposes of today, we're not going to limit spirituality to a particular faith tradition. So we're not going to just talk about Christian spirituality or Jewish spirituality, but in a way that allows you to uh, apply what we talk about to your own faith tradition, if you have one, because we, we are all spiritual beings. We are all people who have an inner self. Um, for some people, though, that isn't connected to a faith practice or a religious tradition, um, even though for others, those work together. Um, spirituality is, is basically a, a belief in a higher power. It can take a lot of forms. Some of it's God or Allah or Buddha, or it can be nature or relationship or inner self. Um, So we're going to define spirituality kind of in a, in a less specific, but more um, universal sense. Um, And like I was saying, spirituality and religion are, are different, but you need both sometimes that they, they, they're they work together in um, complementary ways. Spirituality, excuse me, spirituality is is personal. It's it's flowing, changing. It's about your feelings. It's about how you interact with the world around you. It's it's an in inward uh, 
it's an inward experience of the world around you, whereas religion is defined and structured. It's, it's formal. It has denominations. It has churches. It has worship practices. It has ritual. Uh, for some religions, it um, has doctrines. And so um, it's, it's a more outward experience of, of spirituality. And again, sometimes we need more, one more than the other. Sometimes when we feel disconnected from our spiritual self, the routine of ritual in religion can help us reorient ourselves back to our spiritual selves. And sometimes bringing our spiritual selves into our religious practice um, connects us to that practice in, in a deeper, more meaningful way. Um, but spirituality, especially in caregiving and especially with seniors, is important. Um, spirituality opens us up to the idea that the universe is ultimately benevolent. Um, it opens us up to the idea that the, the world around us, the obstacles that we consistently overcome year after year, decade after decade, um, are moving us in a positive direction. And, and the reality is every obstacle we overcome is, is a success, is, is a benevolent act in our own lives. Um, a spiritual life can open people up to the possibility that there is a greater purpose acting in your life. And when we are in dark times, when caregiving is hard, that is a source of strength and hope when we don't see much hope in other places. It's, it's the hope that the hope is there, right? Um, spirituality and dementia, Care Partners focuses quite a bit on um, our work with memory loss. So for me, this is an important piece to what we do. Um, spirituality can improve, but I will say, Dementia or not, um, this is true for all of us. Um, spirituality can improve quality of life for seniors with dementia. Um, practicing a religion or, or religious rituals or traditions can help slow cognitive decline and reduce or stabilize cognitive disorders. It's a habit that somebody has done for years and years. And, and by repeating those behaviors and those rituals, we continue to internalize all of that and, and work our brains. Um, it, the use of spirituality in daily life enables those with dementia to preserve relationships, maintain hope, and find meaning. When we practice spirituality in a faith tradition, we are interacting with friends and church family and, and the people around us. And all of those interactions bring another level of, of hope and peace to somebody's life. Um, and the belief in God or the belief in a higher power tends to increase with age. As we, as we age, as we get older, um, our need for um, that faith life becomes greater. And I think that it brings us more peace. Um, cognitive impairment does not eclipse our innate need as human beings for inner peace, prayer, and rituals. Even when we're caregiving, whether we're caring for somebody who has physical disabilities or emotional disabilities or cognitive disabilities, our loved ones need that inner peace, those prayers, those rituals, just as much as they need them, if not more, in, in a whole body sense. Our disabilities do not take away the need for peace and interaction and community and spirituality. They, in, in a lot of ways, make them even greater. And those bonds, those social bonds that we, we uh, create in community can be comforting in, in very difficult times. And faith, faith and spirituality often provide a support system for those who are handling some difficult issues. Um, when you are, so 
as a caregiver, you're often responsible for your loved one's physical needs, your, your loved one's cognitive needs, your the day-to-day -day life of, of your loved one and managing it. Um, but you also may end up caring for or guiding your loved one's spiritual life as well. You know, even if you're just deciding whether or not to make the effort to go to church or watch church online or get out in nature and connect with your spirituality in that way. Um, so we have to be cognizant that maybe their experience of their spirituality is different than ours and help them meet those needs in, in the way that it works for them. So while it's different, it's important to let your loved one guide you in the way they want to practice their faith. Sometimes when we're dealing with um, an impairment of some way, it's very difficult to be vulnerable out in your faith community in that way. And, and they may not want to be vulnerable in their community in that way. So finding a new way to practice spirituality in a way that speaks to them or, or that they connect with can be very helpful. Um, our spirituality, when, when we are sick or, or facing a challenge can also lead to a lot of anger. Um, that, that disconnection from spirituality can um, create a disconnection within ourselves and um, or we tend to lean more heavily on our spirituality and more heavily on our faith practices. Um, and, and sometimes it's both in the same day, right? Sometimes uh, we are mad at God and other times we are asking for that higher power to, to be in our life and, and to interact within us. Um, so bringing in those, those practical um, spiritual practices is an important way to help your loved one as a caregiver. Um, and, and sometimes we have to try new things. Sometimes we have to do it in a different way, but helping them to connect to those practices is important. You know, um, praying together, singing together, um, rituals like communion or Sabbath can be very important. And, and getting out in nature or finding new ways to connect with your spiritual community. Um, even in a time when we are all experiencing the COVID fatigue and we would really like to be in person, connecting with a spiritual leader over Zoom is better than not connecting at all. And I, I feel like I can speak for, for those of us who are spiritual leaders we want to connect however we can. And if that means a Zoom meeting at 7 p.m. after dinner, then that's, that's how you make it happen. But as always, don't push. Let your, let your loved one be the guide in this process. But for yourself, there's also considerations. Um, and, and honestly, <laughs> Melissa hit all of this really well. Um, but it's important to ask yourself as a caregiver, what brings you peace? What brings um, spiritual presence, spiritual peace into your life? And it's different for everybody. And it's different day to day. Um, some days meditation works. And I'll tell you, YouTube is an amazing resource. I did not understand everything that was on YouTube until this year, you can get on there and listen to meditative music or guided meditations. You can play sounds of nature. Um, even when you can't get outside, when you can just look at nature from your window, listen to bird song and that'll just help you connect in a new way. Um, volunteer in the community. For many of us, myself included, spirituality is about relationship and it's about being with other people. And so volunteering, and finding a way to help somebody else with your loved one is an important way to practice your spirituality and practice that connection with others. Um, reading the Bible or other inspirational books, whatever you happen to find inspirational. Um, audiobooks are a great help, I will say. I, I love my audiobooks. Um, attend worship in whatever way you can right now. If that's what speaks to you, then attending worship online, again, connects you in some way to your community, even when you are isolated. 
or find a small group to practice your your spirituality in like a, a bible study or a book study or a friend group that you meet with and have cocktails on a regular basis um whatever helps you connect with community and if worship isn't for you get outside and and melissa talks so much about this so so richly um getting outside and the the healing and the peace and the looking up that that all of that brings I feel like I can breathe more and then I can breathe more deeply when I'm outside, even if it's just 30 seconds to, to step outside and smell fresh air. Um, keeping a journal, reaching out to friends. And I'll tell you, this is, this is a really hard thing for caregivers to do. Um, it's hard to feel like you're a burden. It's hard to feel like you have to um, explain everything that you need over and over and over again um, when you just need somebody to cut your lawn. Um, it's hard to have, feel like you have to explain why you need to cut your lawn because your loved one is sick and, and all of that. Um, and so I often tell caregivers to just keep a list in your pocket of things you need so that when somebody asks what they can do to help, you have a list in your pocket. I need this, one, two, three, boom, boom, boom. Um, because your friends do wanna help and, and they do wanna connect with you and don't always know the right way to do that for you. So phoning a friend, calling them up saying, I need to cry for five minutes and then I gotta go, or I gotta tell you this hilarious thing that just happened. Um, your friends want to be there for you and, and finding that connection is another way to help uh, bring peace into your own self. Um, a few others, tell your story. Tell, talk about the good times. Those memories are what sustains you in the bad times. Uh, music is always, 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 always a great way to connect with yourself and your loved one, always. That will never change. And outside of COVID, when we are caregiving and that isolation really sets in, we miss being touched. We miss hugs. We miss holding hands. We miss those, those physically intimate moments that we have when we're able to be more out in the community. And so sometimes the best way to, to enhance that sense of touch in your life is to go get a massage. Even if it's just one of those like massage chairs in the um, mall that you get a five minute massage on your head and neck, it's totally worth it. Um, chair yoga, if you can't get down on the floor like me, do chair yoga. That, the act of breathing and stretching and aligning your body is another great way to connect with that spiritual self within you. Um, and, and give yourself permission to do none of it. If, if what you need right now is none of it, then that's okay too. Um, well-being is more than just physical. Um, and I, I think I can only see a few of you on my screen, but I, I see some nodding heads. So I think I'm on, I'm on par with that. We can't neglect ourselves as caregivers, which we all lean towards doing. Taking care of yourself physically is just as important as taking care of yourself emotionally and spiritually. And so finding those moments to connect with your spiritual self, even if it's five minutes a day, will give you more hope. It will restore your sense of self, your sense of, of well-being, your self, sense of self-care. Um, and it, it gives us a level of dignity that we don't always find as, as seniors or, or as caregivers or as those needing care. When we connect with our spiritual practices, we, we are given an opportunity to treat ourselves as whole beings. And, and that brings a sense of dignity and strength and purpose along with that. So 
um, I just kind of wanted to conclude. It's all about the grace. Um, this is this is my favorite part of, of my own personal faith traditions. Um, when we find the strength to forgive ourselves or to welcome grace from our friends, from our loved ones, from our faith, um, we are stronger because of it. Um, when we allow ourselves to be mad at our situation, to be mad at our loved one, to be mad at the world, and then just let it go. Forgive yourself for those feelings, allow yourself to feel them. And then like Melissa was talking, okay, I've, I've spent my five minutes with my anger, I'm gonna go do the dishes or do what I need to do next. Um, and, and to give yourself grace if you don't want to connect with your spirituality, if you don't want to connect with your faith community right now, if that is going to bring hardship or stress or anxiety into your life, maybe it's not the right thing right now. And that's okay too. Um, there are other ways to connect with your, your spirituality and five minutes of prayer counts. Um, five minutes of breathing outside in the trees, that counts too. We don't have to commit three hours every day in order to um, fully connect with our spiritual selves. And asking for help. There are all kinds of people out there who can help you in the way that you need help. Um, because it's different for all of us. There's counseling, there's spiritual direction, there's faith leaders, there's yogis, there's um, meditation, Buddhists who, are, who want to teach you how to meditate. There's, there's all kinds of people out there that can help you. And, and you just have to kind of make the effort to find the right way that you need that help in that moment. And, and that's a process sometimes. So giving yourself the grace to go through that process and to fail or not find the right connection right away is, is totally okay. And I think out of all of it, to forgive yourself for not being perfect and to forgive your loved one for not being perfect or, or having a bad day or um, losing your temper, all of that is so important. All of the grace that we give to those around us, all of the grace that we give to our loved ones or to our family or to our friends, we all deserve that too. We deserve our own grace as much as we are willing to give grace and forgiveness and support to others. Um, I think that was my last page. Let's see. Let me stop my share. Okay. Yeah, I see I couldn't get the chat when I was on the screen also. So I will see if I can go through those in a minute. Um, I, I think, and I, and I think I said this, but I think the biggest message that our faith can give us is one of grace and forgiveness. Um, one of remembering that we are spiritual selves, that caregiving is not all that we are. And that yes, we have to go out and exercise. Yes, we need to drink our water. But we also need to find ways to check in with our inner selves. And, and that's one of the reasons that when Melissa was talking about that, that moment, that liminal space between action and reaction, where we get to decide how we're going to handle something, those are moments of, of grace and moments where we can connect with that inner self. And it's so important to um, take that deep breath. And, and say a prayer or sing a hymn or, or uh, just, just connect internally before you um, make that next decision. So uh, Melissa and I have kind of done a lot of, of woo-woo head stuff. Um, and I wanted to invite Miss Leslie to come and talk to us. Leslie, and I'll let you tell however much of your story you'd like to tell. But um, Leslie has been a, was a caregiver for a long time, and, and she knows the ins and outs of, of caregiving, of crisis, of the practical ways that she was able to internalize all of the stuff that, that 
you're supposed to do as a caregiver and supposed to act and know as a caregiver um, in a practical way. So Leslie, I will invite you to share with us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Leslie. I took care of my husband and my oldest son. After my husband was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, about a year later, my oldest son was diagnosed with terminal cancer. So I had uh, caregiving for both. But I can tell you this much. I'd rather talk about what I've learned and how it can help you going forward. Caregiving is one of the toughest jobs. I think it's tougher than being a parent. But it's the most rewarding um, you find out what you're made of, and I experienced true unconditional love with my loved one. So that to me was amazing, just amazing. I don't regret anything I did. I was grateful I kept him as home as, lo as long as possible. My thing was to make sure he had as much independence as possible, which we did. But I can tell you from my own experience, the best thing you can do for yourself is get see a doctor, get yourself in check. See them on a regular basis. Um, if you're having bouts of depression, anxiety, get on an antidepressant. There is absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's going to help you cope. I've been on one for years. Um, you know, it's just, you got to do what you got to do to stay healthy. Um, you know, and another thing that for me that worked well was um, I'm a big believer in support groups. I saw a therapist and after three visits, she goes, oh, I think you're fine. Kind of blew me away. But um, the support groups, especially with dementia, if you've got questions, you can call someone in the support group. You can bounce ideas off each other and find out, you know, did your loved one go through this or what worked for you or, you know, what are you doing about this? That was a tremendous, huge help for me, having that support within that group. And we still communicate, a lot of us. Um, but I highly, highly recommend getting involved with some type of support group. Um, and everyone's touching about people wanting to help. Bottom line is your friends want to help and don't know how to help you. You have to tell them what you need and don't be afraid. Generally, people want to do whatever they can to support you and your loved one. So you just need to tell them what you need and they're going to be there to help you. Um, I made a list of things. I mean, another thing too is, is keep your friends close. Make sure you keep in touch with your friends. Your friends are, the, are your lifelines. They're the ones that are going to be there for you during, uh, before, during, and after everything. And they are the ones that can, can make your world complete. Uh, let's see. Um, you know, if you still want to take your loved one out, think about going out earlier for dinner. We always, I would take them out and we'd go out before the dinner rush. So if he acted up, okay, fine but there wasn't all that stimulation in the restaurant where he would be overstimulated. And when I take him out at least once a week to eat dinner. Um, after he was diagnosed, I took him on four cruises. He'd never gone one, but he did enjoy them. And the last one I took him on was a lot of work for me, but it was well worth it. And then, um, you know, if you have to move your loved one to a facility, that was a very tough day for me and a tough decision to make, but uh, it was probably the worst day of my life, but it was the best thing I could have done for me because once I moved him to a facility, I went back to being a wife again. I wasn't his caregiver. I couldn't wait every day to go see him. I saw him every day except for when I was out of town and I tried to cut my trips down to a minimum so I didn't have to miss him. But I got all the way up to his death. I almost got, I love you every day from him, even though his words were Yiddish, but he could still tell me that he loved me. And that's a, a tough thing to, to move your love on, but it is something that down the road, some of you might have to do. And, I, and don't wait, do it before your health gets bad. The day I moved him that night, I got violently ill. And it's like two in the morning. It's like, who am I going to call to come help me? So I finally stopped with all, with getting violently ill and finally went to bed and stuff. But that was the only time I had gotten that sick. So I don't know if it was nerves. I think it was probably nerves. So um, I can't really think of anything else. I think those are the key highlights to let y'all know on how you can help yourselves. 
Y'all got any questions? Leslie, I so appreciate that you said, go see a doctor and make sure you have regular appointments. Um, I just think that is something we, even when we are not heavy caregiving, <laughs> we still neglect our own health uh, or maybe we have a stumbling block on certain, certain something. But staying on top of that is just critical. So I really appreciate you mentioning that. I mean, I, I had high blood pressure. It's and now it's it's normal range. I'm like, can I call for bed? She's like, no, we're not doing anything. But you know, they tell you to take, they put me on all these supplements, which mm -hmm. I take. Yeah. So I do what they tell me to do. It's so good. Preventative care and being proactive in your health and in your life. So it's just absolutely key. So thank you. Yeah. And my favorite saying over everything I've been through is I choose life and living over tragedy. And I'm, a, I have an amazing group of, of, of friends, my tribe that are there for every step of that I need. And if I need a day to cry, I can call any one of them and go sit on their porch and cry with, and they'll cry with me. So it's pretty, I, I feel right now I have a pretty fantastic life. Leslie, will you say that your motto again for everybody? I choose life and living over tragedy. Um, I want to invite everybody, if you would like to unmute yourselves or ask questions um, and, and interact or, or anything like that, you are welcome to. I'd like to say that I'm grateful to all three presenters today because I feel like we have received such a, <laughs> I mean, not to uh, play upon the, the title, but a balanced approach to caregiving. I really do. I feel, um, I feel nurtured. So thank you. You're welcome. I think one of the best things that you said, Leslie, that I hear a lot from our caregivers is it's painful and, and difficult when you do have to make the decision to place your loved one um, in a facility, but you did it because it was what you needed. And, and in order to be your husband's wife, you needed somebody else to be his caregiver. And, and that brought yeah. a richness to your relationship that you had been missing for a while. And that was, it's beautiful. And I was so excited every day when I got off work, I get to go see my honey. That's exactly mm -hmm. how I look. I couldn't wait to go. So it was like total 180 after I moved in. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions or comments? If you don't want to talk, you can type it in the chat. Well, I had a, a thought, I guess, that kind of went through all of your talks. <laughs> Um, uh, I'm a flitter. I'm the opposite of a ruminator. I'm a flitter who just bounces all over the place and likes to stay really busy and overstimulates myself. And I realize it's not actually a healthy lifestyle, but it is who I am. So I'm trying to learn to be a better flitter. <laughs> but for me, and I think everybody can relate to this, is we struggle with um, feeling guilty if we're not successful at either doing everything we want to do that we think we should be able to do or, you know, as was mentioned early on by Melissa, I think um, sometimes you, you overwhelm yourself so much that when something happens with your loved one that you're caring for and you have a burst of anger, or a bad response, it, sometimes it will bother me for days because I feel so guilty about it. So, you know, that, that's where what the programs you guys are presenting help us to kind of refocus on not being so guilty and not beating ourselves up. And the support groups help with that too. I haven't yet connected with an actual support group that's virtual, but I'm working on it. But I've been attending all of your events and, it, and that's a support group in itself. Amen. Valerie, I really appreciate you 
mentioning that. I think um, it's also, I, I think it's, and, and, and how you uh, connected that flittering with that sense of guilt as well. And so rather than thinking, and I love your perspective, rather than thinking that you need to change who you are, because sometimes flitter, flitterers or ruminate, that's part of our, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a part of kind of how we've identified, but how can we bring up another quality to balance that rather than stuff down who we are or deny? So for flitterers, <laughs> what, what kind of pauses can you incorporate that mo those moments of like, even just a pause, like just a brief pause, rather than try to make yourself rest or take a long nap, like that's probably never going to happen. <laughs> like it doesn't feel probably realistic for a flitterer. But just, just instead of thinking I need to change who I inherently am, what can I add or bring a, a different quality up to meet that? Um, because you're inherently wonderful. Yeah, I know for a fact I'm not going to change who I am. I was <laughs> born and created that way. Also, I just recently discovered the idea of using a baby monitor. And I want to say that has relieved my guilt because if I wanted to try to get outside in the yard and just take a breath, that I couldn't relax. It was that constant. Well, what if he falls down? What if something happens, he starts, you know, something's on fire. So I just, um, somehow somebody else was talking about worrying about their child and trying to get something done out in the yard. It clicked with me and I said, why, why not get a baby money? So it has really worked because it, it, it alleviates the guilt, you know, because I can still hear what's going on in the house. Mm -hmm. And you get to hear cute moments too, because we have a big dog who's 90 pounds and they love each other and you get to hear those interactions and that makes me really happy. Yeah. I wanted to take a minute and just read some of the comments in the chat because there's a few things in there that I just, I really liked. Um, something that Lynette had said, she says she remembers praying in a hospital with someone who she assumed was cognitive who was not cognitively present, um, just had a, a brain surgery. Um, and she began praying with her far more powerfully and expressive than, than her attempts. And so she just wanted to share that. And I just thought that was really amazing. Um, and there's a few recommendations from people as well. So iHeartRadio has a lot of meditation sounds of nature. Um, so that's another resource. Um, Melissa put in the chat some different free meditations. So if you scroll up, you can find some of that. That's really helpful as well. Um, oh, here's a great tip too. Taking your yoga mat outside to meditate or do yoga um, or even a nap is great. She says she takes the baby monitor with her so she can listen. I think that was Valerie who just shared. Um, and then Lynette again says, it's all, it is all about grace. Easier to remember that for others than for ourselves. So I, I always try to remind people of that too. We have to give ourselves grace. Um, See. And then a bunch of people just really appreciate you sharing your story, Leslie, just as we do. Um, thank you so much for being thank you. and sharing. Any other questions or anything? I just wanted to say that one of the things that this is just going to be sound silly, but it's not silly. One of the things that I'm going to remember about today is going into my feet there are moments when you need to feel grounded. And to me, that's what the feet thing would do. I mean, I've always, you know, go inside yourself, count to 10, take deep breaths, all of that. But I love the feet thing for that reason, that grounding and, you know, so thank you for that. Yeah, I had never heard of that technique. We flitterers don't do the feet thing. because We're <laughs> like, <laughs> so I really am gonna work on that. That's very helpful. That's a big one for flitterers. So if you can get far away from here <laughs> and feel the ground. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. I'm not going to use this term, flitter. 
I've, I've known yeah, about really in yoga it's it's vata if you're familiar with ayurveda it's like a vata um I like cre- this. creatives very creative you may be like you start a project and then you just like no i'm done with that i'm gonna start another one and no no that one's not exciting i'll do a different one people who are not in our world do not understand it we have very <laughs> messy environments everything is extremely messy but we know exactly where everything is and we crave having 10 projects going at one time it's a craving it's a personality and we do okay with it 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 works for us but you know friends of mine say i would just go nuts living in your world (laughs) i'm a hybrid (laughs) we like multitasking (laughs) yeah Which is why my career as a photographer was until I had to step down to stay home. But um, weddings and all that stimulation were fun for me. And for other people, they were terrifying. So, you know, to be a wedding photographer for many people seems so scary, but it actually worked for my cravings. Well, thank you, Valerie, for sharing. And everyone else, thank you for having me. I, um, I, I love this and I love the opportunity to share um, any resources that I can. So I appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. I've got a question for the caregivers. Do y'all have a medical ID bracelet for your loved one that, he, that they carry all the time or wear? No. It's a good idea. I hadn't even thought about it. Yeah, you can go online and have it put with, I had one for my husband that said he had dementia and it had three contact phone numbers on the back. Oh, wow. That's a great idea. Right. So I you can order those my, online. I had one. Uh, yes, you can order them online. And I had one when my, my son had cancer and uh, they are a great comfort if there were an accident or something he had a blood cancer you know they they needed to know that if there were anything happened so yes i would really recommend that and especially if your loved one wanders off yes. sorry i'm muted putting it on my calendar right now <laughs> i thought you were gonna say and you're ordering it right now <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now I remember going kicking and screaming into the technology of everything on our phone and now after years of having the calendar on my phone everything on my to-do list goes on my phone right right uh, but not on it I don't do a to-do list like on the document thing because I'll forget about it I put it on the calendar now yeah, yeah and we all know it may get moved 20 times <laughs> to the next day but someday I'll get to it I'm going to say thank you all for having me and and scoot off to my next appointment um, online. So thank you. So thank you so much. Uh, I put in the chat there, if anyone's free tomorrow, I'm doing a talk on anxiety with um, AARP Texas. So, and it's, it's free of charge. So um, thank you for sharing. You're welcome. It was great to see you, Melissa. Oh, so good. I wish I could give you a big hug, Leslie. So (laughs) soon enough. Yeah, yeah. Next January. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and I guess on behalf of Care Partners, we just want to say thank you all so, so much to all of our speakers for being here and all of the participants. And then, of course, to you, Lynette. Um, we're so grateful for our partnership with Messiah. And so um, just Always thank you all so much. <laughs> we <laughs> hope you all have a great rest of your weekend um, and a great week. Um, and we hope you learned something really fun today. So thank you all so much. Bye, everybody.